Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Aaron Sizer with Westmont's Gaty Institute for the Liberal Arts, uh, which is sponsoring today's lecture. This talk is presented in conjunction with the new Westmont Center for Thriving Communities, which partners with congregations to imagine new ways of joining God's work here on the Central Coast, uh, especially as that involves better understanding the real tangible places where God has planted us. Uh, there are many ways that pastors, lay leaders, faculty, and students can be involved uh, in thriving communities. So please get in touch with us at thriving at westmont.edu, and you can see our little propagandistic splash screen up on uh, the screen here uh, to learn more about how you or your church can participate in that program. A couple of quick procedural notes before we start. Um, at the end of our time today, we'll have some moments for discussion. Um, as you are listening along, as you think of questions uh, between now and then, feel free to drop them into the chat, um, either to the whole room or just directly to me. And I will pose them to our speaker when the time comes. Um, and Dr. Toms, if you are with your class uh, there, feel free to do a little bit of moderation yourself uh, and pipe up if you're getting questions from, uh, from the room. Uh, I'd also mention that this lecture is being recorded. Uh, you can do as suits you with your camera but please know that there's some possibility that your video or audio could be uploaded to Westmont's YouTube channel. Well, I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Dr. Norman Wurzbaum is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Christian Theology and Senior Fellow of the Kennan Institute of Ethics at Duke University. Dr. Wurzba grew up on a farm in Alberta, Canada before going on to an academic career in theology and philosophy. Those apparently very different lives actually cohere brilliantly in his work when he writes about nourishment, as in his well-known book, Food and Faith, when he writes about humanity's place in the physical world, for instance, in his books, From Nature to Creation, or Making Peace with the Land. The relevance of agrarian patterns of life for understanding God's designs for humanity is everywhere evident in Dr. Wurzba's writings but receives special focus in books like Living the Sabbath, Discovering the Rhythms of Rest and Delight. And he's also a scholar of one of the great agrarian writers of our time, Wendell Berry, whom he's written both about and with. His newest publication, uh, just, just weeks old at this point, is This Sacred Life, Humanity's Place in a Wounded World. Dr. Wurzba is one of the foremost scholars helping us think Christianly about who we are as people, and how our lives are enmeshed with those of other creatures right here and now. I'm grateful for the ways that his work returns theology to the soil of real experience and to him for being with us virtually today. Welcome, Dr. Wurzba. All right, thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to be uh, with you under the auspices of thriving communities. It's a, it's a great uh, tag for thinking about all sorts of questions and one of the things I like to point out to folks is that so often when we talk about thriving communities, we assume that we're only talking about people. And, and I think that's a, that's a big, big mistake because you know if we're thinking in a specifically Christian way and we say that we want to love our neighbors, we can't love them very well if we don't also love the neighborhoods in terms of which they live. So neighbors and neighborhood have to go together, I think. And, and to bring in neighborhood means you have to bring in all kinds of things like land and water and things like built environments, infrastructures, homes, housing, parks, farm fields. All these things are so crucial to the way human beings either flourish or not. And so a lot of the work that I try to do is, is trying to bridge this, this sometimes divide between people and their places. So yeah, I want to talk about place this evening, and I want to start by just saying a little bit about uh, my recent experience. I, I just got back from uh, Glasgow, Scotland, where I attended the COP26 meetings. I was there for nearly 10 days. It was a long time to be around 40,000 people from all over the world who have come to address what is clearly one of the most pressing and complicated of all issues human beings have ever faced. And it was, in, in a lot of ways, a really overwhelming and educational experience because you have the full range of emotions from the, the sort of energizing, inspiring experience of being in a youth march with 50,000 other people. And then on Saturday, again, in the full march of an estimated 100,000 people all advocating 
for climate justice that our world needs because so many of the people I met, young people, indigenous folks, um, what's very clear to them is that climate change is not a hypothetical reality. It's, it's very personal. It's affecting their home places, their communities in serious ways. And so the sense of urgency um, was, was palpable all throughout Glasgow. And I thought I would start there because one of the reasons I went to this meeting, I'd never been to a COP meeting before, but I went this year because I really wanted to get a sense for how people from around the world are thinking about their places, how they think about, how they think about land, how they think about water. And, and what became clear to me is that there was almost uh, two different worlds that were existing side by side at this meeting. Uh, on the one hand, we had people who were working in finance, business, government, policy, who were talking about land and the need for a regenerative agriculture, for instance. And they were doing much of that talking in terms of, of numbers, abstract kinds of figures, like we're talking about 1.5 degrees, or we're talking about parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or we're talking about debt payment. But what was clear when meeting with traditional farmers and meeting with indigenous leaders is that land registered in a very different sort of way. It didn't, it didn't sort of register for them as a, a kind of financial audit sheet, for instance. It didn't register for them in terms of potential markets or even supply lines, inputs, things of that sort. Instead, the land registered in deeply personal ways because for them, the land is their home. And, and this I think is, is so important for us to have in mind because when they talk about wanting to protect land, they're not talking about protecting wilderness. They're not talking about putting up preserves. They're talking about protecting a way of life that makes meaning for their living. Because for these folks, attachment to land is not optional. Right. We live in a modern, industrial, global world, many of us do now, and mobility is just baked into the way we think about our places. If we don't want to be in one place, we don't think much about going somewhere else, because that's what it means to be modern or even postmodern. But this is not at all how indigenous or traditional farming communities think about land. They think about it as their home, they think about it as the source of their identity and really importantly, a source of their meaning. So that to be taken away from their land is to cease to be able to live a meaningful life. And I start with this because I think when you read scripture, you discover that for many of the people who are in scripture, this is also how land registered for them, right? You know about the promised land, you know about God's gift of the land to the Israelites, and what a rupture in Israelite consciousness it was for them to no longer be living in the land that God gave them. So I, I want to, to use this evening to talk a little bit about land, to talk a little bit about place, and why it matters for people to think about place in very careful ways. Because as my opening around COP26 indicated, we can be in a place and think about it in vastly different ways, and as a result, live in it in vastly different ways. So as I mentioned, you know, we could think about place as um, you know, a warehouse or a stockpile of natural resources, but the question would be, why should we think about it that way? And, and we'll get to, to why that might not be the best way to think about it fairly soon. But first, let's just talk very generally about why it matters for us to think about place. So in my book, This Sacred Life, I make the argument that how we think about where we are has a whole lot to say about who we think we are and how we should live. So for instance, let's choose as an example, imagine that you're in a kitchen. What's appropriate to do in a kitchen? Well, clearly it's not appropriate to play basketball there because if you wanna play basketball, you're supposed to be in a gym because the place called a gym signifies this is the kind of place where athletic performance happens. And you being in that space will consider yourself to be an athlete. Just as when you think of yourself being in a kitchen, you will think of yourself as a cook, 
and that baking or cooking are the appropriate things to do. If you try to do gymnastics there, it's not going to work out so well. So now let's extrapolate more generally and ask, what kind of a world do we live in? Is the world a store? Is it a stockpile of resources that we can extract or that we can commodify or that we can purchase, sell? And, and I raise this because this is the way of thinking that has been dominant in Western cultures for a long time. And it's become so dominant that it seems normal. And let me give you an example about why this might be a bit problematic. So I teach in our School of the Environment from time to time, I teach environmental ethics and philosophy, for instance. But one time I was guest lecturing in an evening class and I was asked if I would speak about spirituality and environmental issues. And so we came into the room and students obviously had brought their dinner and they were eating. And I noticed that not a single one of them bowed their heads before they ate. So I thought, well, I'll ask them about it. So I started the class by saying, how many of you stopped to say grace before you ate your meal? And you know, these, these are for the most part, not Christian students as far as I could tell, but they were deeply puzzled by my question. And I said, but why wouldn't you start eating by saying thank you to God or whomever, you know, the great spirit being or whomever you might have in mind? And I said, well, the reason you might think about doing that is because what's at issue here is what you think about food. And again, they were a bit puzzled. I said, so what is food? And they said, well, it's just stuff, right? We grow it. We process it, we distribute it, we buy it, and then we eat it. It's like fuel. And I said, wait a minute. Are you sure you want to go down that train of thought? And they said, well, why shouldn't we? Because that's what it is. It's just stuff. And we grow it and we consume it. And I said, but if it's just stuff, you've reduced food to being a commodity. And as soon as you've reduced food to a commodity, you've also made it susceptible to the logics of efficiency, profitability, consumption, privatization. And then their brain started to go to work and they said, oh, wait a minute, this is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because they all come to the Nicholas School because they want to save the planet. But why would you want to save the planet if it's just a stockpile of stuff? And it isn't much more meaningful than that. So what's at issue here is how we think the places of our lives signify. Is a place just a location where we stand, where we grow our stuff, where we process our stuff and consume our stuff? Or is place something different than that. And I think when we look at a meeting like COP26 and the COPs that preceded it and the COPs that will follow from it, this is the big question that's on the table, but it's not being addressed very clearly. So many of the sessions I went to were very clear that they're very concerned about the fact that we're plundering the planet right? We're wasting our soils, we're polluting our waters and air, we're creating massive amounts of species extinctions, plant and animal extinctions. So there's this big concern that we're doing something terrible to this planet, and not just the planet in general, but the very particular communities in which indigenous communities live, or the very particular regions where young people are terrified about a future in which they see diminished prospects because coastal flooding, interior flooding, droughts, forest fires, all the things that we know accompany climate change. And what became clear is that this was the problem that was clearly in their minds, but they were having difficulty talking about it because they weren't able to speak clearly about the fact that what has gotten us here is the idea that the whole world exists to be purchased. The whole world exists to be mined. 
and appropriated by human beings. And of course, it's not evenly appropriated because we know that so much of the mining, extraction, commodification, profiteering has happened at the hands of a very small percentage of the world's population. Whereas many other people, the great, great majority, have been small landholders, peasants, uh, migrants even. So what we need, I would argue, when thinking about COP meetings, when thinking about our places, is a mindset that's vastly different than the one that reduces our places to simply a location where we can you know, consider it to be a stage where human beings can do the cool things that they do, or we think of it as a production platform where we mine it for as much wealth as we can. So that's, I think, where we are. And as I said, at COP, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety, worry about whether or not at least some human beings, the rich and powerful in particular, are finally going to destroy this planet, render it uninhabitable for millions, billions of people, which of course is why we've got some very wealthy people who are taking flights of fancy and building the kinds of spaceships that will get them an escape to some other planet which is yet to be terraformed by us. It's a rather ridiculous notion, but nonetheless, there's a kind of cynicism in that because it recognizes that the plundering of our places, the sort of siphoning off of the fertility and vitality of places is almost a foregone conclusion. What I wanna to say to you is that that is not a foregone conclusion because we know that there are other ways that people not only think about this earth, think about their places, their farm fields, their neighborhoods, that don't require us to think in terms of commodification. And so I want to turn now specifically to how Christians might speak about the places of their lives. And I think this is important because the way Christians speak about this clearly has specificity, but it also resonates, I think, with many of the world's great religious traditions. And the way to, to characterize the difference most broadly is to say that for Christians and other people of faith, the world is not a production platform. The world is not a big warehouse. The world is not a store. Instead, it's a created realm. And to say that it's created at the most basic level means that we live in places among fellow creatures that are first and foremost gifts rather than commodities. So that's a big thing to say, but what does it mean to say that we live in a world that is gift or to think that we live in places that are gifts? Well, the first thing I think we can do is we can, we can go to our own scriptures and talk about how the world of creation is characterized in scripture. And I think the first thing to note is that scripture has multiple creation stories. It's not just Genesis 1 or Genesis 2. We find many stories within scripture. Job is another example. The Psalms are examples. The prophets have their versions of creation stories. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we find a complete rewrite that builds upon these stories in terms of the person of Jesus. So, we can get to some of that uh, if you'd like in, in the Q&A, but let's think for a minute about how scripture describes the world as God's creation. The first thing to note is that nothing has to exist. The fact that it exists is because God wants it to. And why does God want things to exist? Why does God want places to exist? Why does God, in Genesis 1, for instance, create a world in which we see that God takes pleasure in what is being made? right? That it's good that we have land and that we have oceans and that we have sky that are populated with birds, fish, and animals. Why does God take delight on that first Sabbath sunrise when looking out onto the created order? Why does God create a garden if we turn to Genesis 2, right? What's being communicated here other than the fact that things exist not simply as stuff, but things exist as 
the what what's the best way to put this as the physical material embodied manifestation of the love of god right when i talk about food i say that food is god's love made nutritious and delicious but we could say this about all creatures all creatures all places are god's love variously made visible fragrant, tactile, auditory, and delicious. Now that sounds a little bit sentimental, but it's not because what it's communicating is not only that the whole of creation, right? And we have to emphasize the whole of creation, which means every square inch, every creaturely being from the smallest microorganism in your gut to the largest mammal or the largest sequoia or whatever. Every one of them exists because of God's love. And they're not just the objects of God's love. They are also the media through which God's love and power are active in the world. This is a game changer because it means, for instance, that we should never think of any creature or any place as subject to the logics of profitability, efficiency, maximization, utility. Because you can have a vague sense for why this would be a problem if people treated you as simply a unit of production or a unit of consumption, or you mattered only in terms of your utility or your efficiency. Any of you have a friend who is not making your life more efficient, but perhaps making it a little bit more difficult because they don't agree with you all the time. They don't do what you want them to do, right? Because people are all unique. As we like to say theologically, each person is the distinct child of God that they are. And to love them, you have to learn to accept them for who they are rather than make them fit a ledger sheet in which you have debits and credit columns, you know, we don't want to have too many debits, otherwise people are going to leave us behind. The commodification logic that I was talking about earlier that reduces the world to a stockpile of natural resources has never been simply applied to land. It's always been applied to human communities. And we've seen this obviously in the way we've treated people historically, rendering them as indentured servants or as slaves and lest we think that we're past that, we need to realize that so much of today's agriculture is made possible only because of a migrant agricultural workforce that is treated a whole, not a whole lot better than many people working at the very bottom scales, sometimes in near slave-like conditions. So we have to appreciate that the world in which we live has often had the effect of reducing what I call the sanctity of life. When we look at the creation of God's world, what we discover is the creation of a sacred world in which the sanctity of creatures, the sanctity of places is foremost in God's mind. To put this very simply, God did not create a store. God did not create a warehouse. God did not create even a mine. What God created are places, diverse places that are fertile and fecund, that are generative, right? Think about that first creation story. It's not just that God imposes an order upon the world, but God works with this order that is being created so that it participates with God in the bringing forth of ever new and fresh life. If this is a world that God esteems and values, not just because God makes it, but because it has integrity of its own, which even God takes delight in. And we could say that even God respects because God does not deal with creatures in a coercive manner. So this is all I know somewhat abstract, but the implications of this are enormous because if we live in a world that is created by God, if we live in a world that is the material embodied manifestation of God's love, then we have to respond to this world differently than the posture of 
grasping or hoarding. I think what we all understand is that when we're talking about encountering a world or a set of gifts, the thing we have to learn to do is we have to learn how to receive rather than grasp, right? I know Christmas is coming very soon. People in your household would be horrified if you simply went around grabbing all the presents for yourself because that's not the right posture to have. Or think about when you go in church and you have communion. You don't come to the communion table like this. You come to the communion table like this because you come with open hands to receive. Because when you learn to receive, you recognize that, first of all, the gift is given to you as an expression of the giver's love for you. And so to, to presume to simply grasp is to short circuit that expression of love. Now, when you receive, one of the first things you're supposed to do is obviously express gratitude. But we need to take the step further by saying that gratitude, while it's very important and right to do, is not enough. Gratitude isn't completed or fulfilled, we might say, until it issues in us becoming generous with others. So if you think about coming to receive a gift like this, you also then turn to your neighbor with that same open hand to share. Because the logic of receiving is different than the logic of grasping, right? When you grasp a possession, you take it out of circulation so you can have it for yourself. But when you're working within a gift mentality or a gift economy, you receive, but then also share with others as an expression of your gratitude because you realize it was never yours to begin with. Right? And scripture speaks this way over and over again because it says the land is mine, God speaking, and it's not yours to have. You are here to live in the land and in your living bear witness to it as a gift from me to be shared with the world. And in that sharing, what we do, which is so important, is we actually witness to the gift as the expression of God's love. What I'm trying to get at is that when we talk about our places as places of gift, we have to learn to live in them somewhat differently because rather than trying to get a tight hold or control of the world, we learn to loosen the grip on the world. We learn to receive it and share it and hold lightly the gifts that have been given to us. Because we know that when we hold tightly to the things of this world, when we try to control the world, try to privatize the world, take it out of circulation by hoarding it for ourselves. We deprive others of the nurture that they need. We deprive others of the housing that they need. What was so clear in Glasgow, Scotland, is that billions of people are suffering because certain segments of the world's population are hoarding everything for themselves. And so the posture of sharing that is so important for the good of our world communities is being short-circuited. As Gus Speth, one of the great thinkers about our current environmental moment has said, we used to think that the problems around environmental issues, climate change issues were technical scientific and that we could engineer our way out of them. And what we're realizing is that that's not the case at all. The problem that we face in the world is a spiritual one. It's a cultural one because our societies are too much characterized by greed and selfishness and fear. And so the question is, how are we going to learn to live in our places without fear, without greed, but in a posture that wants to welcome and share the gifts that we already enjoy by being in a place, by being in a community. The logic of love is so unique in human societies because 
so much of our thinking economically presumes that if I don't have it and don't keep it for myself, I'm somehow diminished. But the logic of love works in a very different way because what the logic of love says that in receiving it and sharing it, the love actually grows, right? The circulation, the sharing of gifts actually increases the value of the gifts. But to do that, we have to sort of give up this desire we have, this fear that we have, that we don't have enough. Which is why in the biblical traditions, one of the most important teachings that we hear over and over again is that people have to learn to trust God. They have to believe that the God who is love and who makes the world out of love as the material expression of love is not going to let creatures down. And we know that this is very hard to learn because the ancient Israelites upon leaving Egypt had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, right? A whole generation needed to disappear because that was a generation that had learned the ways of insecurity and control and violence that were dominant in Egypt. And they needed that time in, in, in the wilderness wandering where they were gonna to learn to trust God. And of course, the story of manna is one of the paradigmatic stories that teaches the people that God takes care of creatures and we need to learn to trust God. Let's now move a little bit to the New Testament because I know that sometimes people say, well, that's all Old Testament teaching and New Testament doesn't really have a whole lot to say. And I think that's just a, a big, big mistake because first of all, we see that from scripture's beginnings, there is a redescription of the whole of creation in terms of the life of Jesus. I think here of John's prologue that says that in the beginning was the word, all things came to be through the word. And without this word, nothing came into being, right? There's a, a sort of parallel here between Genesis 1 in the beginning and John 1 in the beginning. But it's a redescription in terms of Jesus. Or think here about the Colossians hymn, one of the earliest hymns we think, describing what these Christians believed about Jesus and why he mattered and what they said is that he's the image of the invisible God, the icon. I think that's a better translation. And that through him, all things came to be. All things exist through him and for him. And in him, all things hold together. This is, again, a redescription of the whole world in terms of Jesus. Now, what this is odd way of speaking, I know. But what Christians were saying, and this is really, really important, is, as I said earlier, it's only the love of God that brings about the creation of any place, any creature. What Jesus shows us and what Christians believed about Jesus is he showed us what this divine, eternal, creating love looks like in a human body, worked out in a human community, worked out in a human economy, worked out in a human built environment. What does Jesus do? He shows us what this love looks like today, living in a world that is much wounded by violence, that is much wounded by insecurity and fear. And what does Jesus show us? But that if we're going to receive this world as a gift from God, we have to learn the postures of gratitude and humility and generosity, mercy and things like that. But most basically, we need to learn to nurture the world that nurtures us. Put another way, we need to figure out how to make our love move within the love of God that is constantly enabling life to flourish, if it's going to flourish at all. I know that's sort of abstract theological speak, but... The implications couldn't have been more practical. So for instance, when we look at the Acts community, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon these early Christians and what happens? Remarkable things to be sure. We, we think about things like they're speaking in tongues, but I want us to think just briefly about the economic dimensions of their new life together. We're told they ate together in remembrance of Jesus, that they brought what they owned and shared it with everyone else. They lived in gladness, 
and they lived in such a way that not a single one among them had any needs at all. This is a community that understood that to receive each other, they needed to share with each other. And to share with each other means you have to look after each other. And we look after each other in the most basic sorts of ways by making sure they have enough to eat, by making sure that they have a place to live, by making sure that they get the, the support and the care they need when they're in pain and suffering. Right? Paul talks about this repeatedly in his letters about how these ecclesia, these groups of Christians, formed so as to be a support, or as he puts it, to be sources of upbuilding for each other. And it's not just patting each other on the back, it's the actual work, the practical economic work of looking after each other. And this love that animated their looking after each other didn't remain within an exclusive community that separated itself from the world. Because what we know is that this early Christian community grew very, very quickly in a not very friendly context, such that what, went, what, what began with a few hundred people quickly became thousands. And we know that Christians were among the first to advocate for the care of the people who otherwise would have been put to death because they were ill or deformed or what have you. They were the first to develop the care facilities that would later become hospitals. In other words, the love that these Christians showed manifested itself in the very kinds of built environments, the very kinds of economies that were set up to help each other thrive. And I think this is the important thing for us to, to notice today when we think about our places. What does Christianity have to say about the places of our communities, the places of our societies? And the first thing we might say is that you can't ignore the places where people live because those places are so important for their well being, right? Every infrastructure, every design of an urban place communicates a set of values about what we think life is for, about what we think is important in a life. So the suburb today, for instance, communicates that the most important value is mobility, individualism, right? Houses in suburbs, how many of them have front porches or even sidewalks? The idea is to separate people, individualize people, right? It's encoding a value structure. And I think what Christians need to realize is that we've got an obligation to help people understand that the best life is a shared life. The best life is a communal life in which we understand ourselves to be members who suffer with each other, who rejoice with, with each other, who become sources of practical support. Because as I said earlier, the most important thing for us to learn to do is to nurture the places and the communities that nurture us. And you can't do that just through speech. You have to do that through the, the very specific work of building homes that facilitate a flourishing life, building neighborhoods that promote social spaces in which people can gather and be a support to each other. It presumes that we build energy systems, energy structures, transportation system, distribution centers, all of which communicate that we want you to thrive rather than simply be an item in somebody else's ledger sheet. In other words, what I'm saying is that if we're gonna love each other, which as Christians we're clearly called to do, we're gonna also have to think carefully about the practical context, the lived places, in which their living are going to happen. Because if those are suffering or languishing, the people who live there are going to suffer and languish too. Okay, and here it's worth recalling that in scripture, the covenant that God establishes is never simply with people. The covenant is always a relationship with people and the land. Which again is why when we read this Christ hymn in Colossians, we're told this most amazing thing, 
which is that Christ, through the blood of his cross, was reconciling all things in heaven and on earth to God. God is not simply reconciling to people or even just a subset of people, but God is reconciling to all things, all creatures, all places, because that's where God's love is constantly at work. I'll end with just one image, which I think is really important for us, which again, um, I think really solidifies how place is central to the way we think about God's work in scripture. When I teach about the eschaton, right, the end of time, a lot of Christians start with the assumption that when they die, their souls separate from their bodies and they go off to be with God in some heaven far, far away. And so the afterlife is described mostly as immortality of the soul and its trajectory is away from earth. And as you might know, there's been all kinds of Christian writing that takes great pleasure in describing how the earth is going to be consumed and blown up and left behind, to use the language of one of these series. But if you read the end of scripture, get to Revelation, there are some points about that book that need emphasizing. One, God saying that he will destroy the destroyers of earth. But then more dramatically, at the very end, we get a description not of Christians escaping earth in some disembodied soul-like form to be with God somewhere else. Instead, we find God descending to be with us. The heavenly city is not somewhere else. It's here. It's coming here. Because as John says, the home of God is among mortals. This should only surprise or shock us if we didn't believe that this world mattered to God. But one of the things that's been so important to emphasize from the beginning in scripture is that God loves creation. Because creation is the place where God's love is constantly at work. Genesis 2 gives us the most memorable image of this when God scoops up some soil and breathes into it to make human beings. So that God is so intimately near to us as, be, as to be the breath within our own breath. God has not ever been interested in escaping from creation. Instead, God has constantly been God Emmanuel coming down to creation to be with creatures, to, as John's prologue says, dwell among us in the flesh. Because God's love is realized in bodies, it's realized in homes, it's realized in neighborhoods, it's realized in economies. And if it's not realized in those bodies and places, it's not realized anywhere. So the work of Christians is to figure out how to join their love in this incarnational mode. How can we, through our bodies, through our economies, build homes, neighborhoods, farms, energy grids, communities in which the love of God is active? and reveal, because as scripture suggests to us, to be in the presence of God's love, to taste it, to touch it, is to find the highest expression of delight and joy that is possible. So what we're doing, I think, in our work of placemaking, in our work of community building, is what we're really trying to do is just make more real, make more incarnate, make more practical the love of God that is always already at work in every place, every creature, and every human being. So I think I'll stop there and invite some conversation.
Thank you very much, Dr. Wurzbaum. Um, again, uh, you are welcome to uh, submit questions in the chat, uh, either uh, to me or to the whole room. Um, I think that we are just small enough that it won't get too chaotic uh, if people want to unmic themselves and ask their questions live. Uh, that seems okay too. Uh, so, what questions do we have for Dr. Wurzbaum? Uh, maybe I could lead off uh, with one here. Um, it occurs to me that Christian churches um, have a better than average chance um, of thinking about and valuing places um, in uh, ways that exceed our general cultural ways of doing that. Um, churches are permanent uh, in ways that most people and organizations are not. Um, they have values uh, that are different, uh, we should hope than uh, consumption and production and efficiency. Um, I wonder what uh, examples you have seen of uh, maybe congregations valuing place uh, in the kinds of ways that you're talking about. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think there's, there's lots of ways to talk about this. So on the one hand, there's the very traditional idea of the church as a parish, which means it's in a neighborhood and what it's really trying to do is be of service to the neighborhood. So an example, a pastor I know who lives in Indianapolis had been in this church for quite a while, but realized that a lot of the folks in the church drive from outside the community because that's just the nature of mobility, right? People don't go to the church down the street. They might often drive 20 minutes to an hour to go to a church on the other side of town because that's where they want to be. And you realize this is not really helping the community. So what he did is he worked with his congregational members and said, I want to put together some teams and I want you all to go out walking in the neighborhood, just talking to people, saying, what's going on here? How is life for you? Do you know that we're in this church over here and we want to know if we can help you and we want to know if you can help us, right? So it's not just one directional. And he was completely overwhelmed by the response because first of all, he discovered that the, the, the people in his congregation didn't even know their neighbors, let alone the neighborhood. So they didn't know what the needs were, nor did they know what the resources or potential or the gifts were that when access could really do tremendous work to revitalize a community. But in the course of these conversations, community members said, I've, I've, I love art. I'd love to teach the kids art because I know kids who'd be interested in this. And so the church opened up its doors and said, come teach art after school in our church. She's not a church member, but she decided to teach the kids art. So they got kids coming in the church after school, learning how to paint. And it was a, a wonderful gesture, but there were, you know, little, there were lots of things developed, including micro lending programs to you name it, all sorts of stuff emerged in every community, every congregation is gonna have a different kind of experience about this because the communities, the neighborhoods are all distinct. They all have different potential. They all have different limits or concerns. Another example I can think of is um, a smaller church in the hills of North Carolina here. It's an older church, not too many members. They're thinking about shutting their doors because they just can't sustain a pastor, can hardly pay the bills. But they decided before they shut down, they're going to try one more thing. And what they realized is that there are a lot of people in their community who are food insecure. They don't have access to good food. You know, Dollar General, 7-Eleven, that's what the deal was. So they decided they were going to work with some area farmers and host a farmer's market on the parking lot of the church. And it was amazing because, again, it grew out of a congregation listening to the community and figuring out how they can be a source of care and compassion in a neighborhood that desperately needed it. And a lot of people came to the farmer's market. A lot of people came to this church, not because they wanted to go to church, but because they saw that here are these people, many of them quite elderly, who are showing love for their community. And they honored it. And they took care of these people. And a sense of purpose and mission came back to this congregation because they were wondering, had they lost what they were about? So this is, you know, here, those are just two examples, but I think you're absolutely right to make the point 
churches play a unique role in the contemporary landscape because they're one of the few institutions that A, have property, B, have people who come to this property regularly wanting to do good, intergenerational, lots of different skill sets in these congregations. The task is to figure out how to direct those skills, that compassion, onto a community. Because if churches are not going to be sources of community revitalization, community resilience, even community hope, it's hard to know where, where we're going to find them. And at, at Duke, this is one of the models that we're most encouraging our young pastors to pursue, that they not think of church as a building that they do their stuff within, but to see the church as a node in a large set of centers in a community that in partnering together, in working together, can really help the whole community thrive. Great. Uh, I see a question in the chat here. Uh, this question is from Grace. Uh, she asks, uh, do you believe a gift economy can exist within our capitalist economy? Um, and maybe the question here, if I can editorialize a bit, um, is sort of about the hegemony of uh, capitalism. Um, yeah. Is it possible, you know, in an economic scheme or just a mental scheme or an ecclesial scheme or anything else to think our way outside of uh, the capitalism and the consumption that sort of uh, defines our lives? Yeah, yeah. No, that's also a really good question. Um, there's a professor at Duke named Frederick Jameson who's very well known for the line that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, just as a statement about how entrenched capitalist modes of production, consumption, but then more generally modes of thinking, how, how, how dominant capitalism is. And, and I think the answer is yes to the question, because first of all, we need to know that when we talk about gift economies and historians and anthropologists have done a lot of good work talking about what these gift economies were like, how they functioned, what their purposes and aims were, it's important to underscore that these gift economies always happened within economies in which there were transactions that still occurred. So it wasn't only ever just giving gifts or receiving gifts. There could still be various forms of exchange that went alongside it. Now, what made gift economies important is that there was a ceremonial dimension to them, or what we might use today as a liturgical dimension to them, because people need to be reminded again and again that we don't live by purchasing. We don't live by grasping. That ultimately, we live by receiving. And the ceremonies, like the potlatch that we know about with Native or Indigenous communities, is one example in which communities would come together, in which the giving of lavish gifts commenced as a, a powerful statement. And we still do this in our culture today. Why, why do we give gifts at Christmas? Right? Why don't we just say, let's just go shopping. And I know that there's a temptation to just give people gift cards so they can go shopping. <clears throat> because we, we love the idea of shopping our way through life rather than receiving what somebody has given to us. Uh, because when you receive, you're not, in you're not in charge of the giver. Right? That's important. The giver decides what to give you. Um, and that, that puts us in a different relationship. But it's not just in the, the exchange of gifts that this sensibility of receiving emerges. I, I talked briefly about how one of the powerful images God uses in pre well, we have given in describing God's creation of the world is the Garden of Eden. And the activity of gardening, I think, is a powerful demonstration about how we live by receiving. As a gardener, you know, and I'm, I'm one, I'm not especially good at it, but I do it. I used to farm. I know how hard it is. But one of the things you learn as a farmer, as a gardener, every day is you don't control plants or animals. You have to work with them and they frustrate the heck out of you. And they render you impotent. They render you ignorant, impatient, because they teach you that life is not on your terms. And yeah, you might try to grow tomatoes, but you might not get tomatoes. And you may not have thought you were going to grow potatoes, but you've got them because they're volunteers or 
right? Gardens are places of perpetual surprise and disappointment. And so it teaches you that life is not on your own terms and you have to receive it as it comes to you. And, you know, I describe this in terms of humanity's creaturely condition, which is so important to underscore. But the point remains, we all need exercises, reminders, liturgical performances, ceremonies to help us not lose sight of the fact that the most basic thing about our places, the most basic thing about ourselves is that we're not in control, that we can't make life. We always have to receive it first. And that puts us in a fundamentally different posture and frame of mind where hopefully we'll be better equipped to share uh, the world that we live within rather than simply try to hoard it for ourselves. This question is, this question is from Jim. Uh, he writes, uh, you suggest that life is sacred. Is the non-human creation sacred? What about things that humans create pursuant to our delegated creation mandate? Yeah. Oh, I think absolutely. I think it's a mistake to think that only human beings are sacred. Um, and and I think one of the, the most powerful passages uh, in scripture that, that suggests this to us is in the book of Job. I think Job is one of the most ecological books in scripture because, as you may remember, Job begins with this guy who has it all. He's got wealth, he's got a great family, he's got good reputation, he's got good friends. And the devil makes a deal with God and says, I think the only reason Job worships you is because he's got a pretty good deal. And so God says, well, do whatever you want with this person. And so the devil, as you know, does pretty horrible stuff, takes away his wealth, takes away his family, makes him miserable, friends turn against him. And Job had been thinking that the world exists more or less to satisfy himself, right? It's a world tailored for his flourishing. And, and God, in the speeches from the whirlwind, says to Job, wait a second you don't really have a clue because first of all where were you when i was making the world where are you when there are creatures that you know nothing about are giving birth in a cave don't you understand that i keep watch over every creature that i love every creature and i delight in every creature, even the ones like the behemoth and the leviathan that would kill you if you got close to them. So, right, so Job gives us a radical decentering of the human being in terms of the grand sweep of creation. And it teaches us the hubris in thinking that God only cares about people, or worse, only a subset of people. It doesn't make sense theologically for God to create a world and say, I only like part of it. And it also doesn't make physiological sense that God would love human beings, but not love all the things that make a human life possible, like soil, like water, like air, like energy. So it has, if, if anything is sacred, it all has to be sacred. Now that raises the good question about, well, what about the stuff that human beings make? Because we've obviously made some stuff that's pretty awful, right? Atomic bombs, for instance or the tens of thousands of poisons that are now, you know, killing ecosystems, degrading ecosystems. There's no question that we can take the gifts of God, we can even take the love of God and we can pervert it so that rather than creating fertility or fecundity or just beauty, it can create a mess. So we need to be able to distinguish the things that further life and the things that degrade life. And I think what we'll find is that many of the things that degrade life are things that we have put into play. Because, you know, we can do these things. We can make bombs, right? We can make assault weapons. We can make poisons. But the question is whether or not that's what we're supposed to do. And, and my answer would be that, no, it's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to use our talents uh, to work with the world so as to create ever better conditions for the flourishing of all life together.
This question is from Diana. Uh, she asks, so many church properties were created by grasping and purchasing. Can you share resources, books, or organizations for churches grappling with the acknowledgement that properties were unethically taken from original land stewards? Oh yeah, that's a fabulous question and a very, very difficult one because it's, it's baked into scripture, right? The promised land was not an empty land. And we know that when the Israelites came to this land, people were removed through violence. It's really, really difficult set of texts to work with in scripture, and I'm not going to try to explain them away in this context. But then when we go past the story of the ancient Israelites and the, their entrance into the promised land, we're talking about all sorts of Christians who have gone around the world as missionaries to then take the land from native peoples. And it's, again, one of the saddest sort of side plots or center, even central plot really uh, to the story of Christianity spread around the world. And I think there are some really good people to read about this. Uh, Randy Woodley is an indigenous writer who's been writing about indigenous lands taken by churches. Um, um, oh my, I'm trying to remember the name now of, um, let's see, I should have the book somewhere here on my shelf. Um, Haunted Histories, I think, is the name of the book, which is is about who's who's the guy that does watershed discipleship. Somebody's got to help me. He lives in California. He and his wife Ends, their last name is Ends. They they've written this book, Haunted Histories, and it's all about coming to terms with the violent history that took over land, and how do we now learn to live in communities where we are honest about this violent history. And I think what's clear is reparations has to be on the table. There's no question about this. I think we've got you know, very clear sense that Christian organizations, Christian congregations are the biggest landowners in the world. There's no reason why this land can't be taken back, given back or put to some purpose that serves the needs of communities. And there are examples of this, right? Now in the state of North Carolina, there are roughly 300 United Methodist churches that are expected to fold in the next decade. These are churches that are sitting on acreage. They're often in cities or they're in farming communities. Land is extremely expensive. What if they were to say that rather than just selling the land to a developer, what if they decide to put the land in a trust or in an easement where this land could be put to cultivation or this land can be put to community development, right? Affordable housing for a community or a community development center, right? These become ways for congregations to take land, much of it taken in ways that are dishonorable or unjust and now deciding to turn that land for the purposes of justice, for the purposes of the flourishing of the community. So yeah, there, there's examples of this and it's, it's gonna be very, very important to do uh, because the only way you can deal with a history like this is to first of all, be honest about it and then make practical economic steps to redress the balance. And that means the work of repair, it means the work of return, and it means the work of revitalization. My friend Caleb is writing from the Westmont program in San Francisco. He says, how might Christians view the built environment and how should we think about practices of, of urban and neighborhood renewal? Oh yeah, this is the new frontier, I would argue, because when Christians begin to take place seriously, they recognize that we are constantly making the worlds in which we live. And if churches are serious about incorporating place into their mission, the sense of what they understand church to be, they have to be involved in decisions about what we do with our built environments. And that means taking church, not as church, but church people into city hall. It means taking people into council meetings. It means going to the chamber of commerce. It means you know, fighting things like redlining or uh, discriminatory loan practices or uh, 
looking at housing developments in ways that, again, are going to sequester wealth or further segregate peoples. It means addressing the fact that we've got so many food deserts or food swamps, and therefore we're going to get involved in making sure that people have access to clean, healthy food. They have access to affordable housing. They have access to reliable and safe transportation. Right? All of these things now come on the agenda because it's very clear and has been clear for some time that we're moving into a world which is going to be increasingly urban for people. Right? If you think about this, at the year 2000 was the first time in human history that more than 50% of people worldwide lived in cities than lived on the land. It's estimated that by 2050, something like 75 to 80% of people in the world will be living in cities. So we're seeing this exodus of people from land into cities. Many of these cities are gonna experience tremendous growth. Many of them will become mega cities that will have huge slums associated with them. The question would be, what are churches doing to prepare for these communities? these people who are coming into their cities, into their villages, into their towns that are growing, growing, growing. Are they involved in talking about how the energy system is gonna work? Are they involved in making sure that there are good educational facilities, healthcare facilities, right? These are the kinds of questions um, that I think congregations need to have on the table. And I think given what we know about climate change that's coming and is already active in many parts of the world, there are going to be a lot of displaced people. Okay, when I started reading the IPCC reports 20 years ago, they were talking about how there would be hundreds of millions of climate refugees by the end of the 21st century. Now they're saying that by the year 2050, right, 50 years earlier, we're looking at a billion displaced people worldwide. We have seen what refugees coming from Syria, going into Europe, how they have destabilized communities, whole nation states, and governments. What are congregations doing to prepare for a billion displaced people worldwide? These are major questions. And right now, we're not talking about it enough, and we're not really preparing for it. Because to prepare for it is not just to have some nice slogans. To prepare for it is to be working for the infrastructure that can welcome so many of these displaced people into our communities and make them viable and flourishing citizens with us. I wonder what you would say to young people uh, who, whose lives um, almost by definition are kind of transient, um, who occupy a particular place um, as a kind of incidental feature of uh, their educational goals or where their career has moved them um, for those whose lives are uh, kind of unstable uh, when it comes to place, um, how do they think about investing in uh, the particular place that they inhabit? Yeah, I think the word is in the answer is in the one of the words you use in the question, which is invest. Okay, I, I'm not advocating that people should only ever live where they were born, or that they should never move around. Right? It's, it's perfectly fine for people to have some mobility. The problem is for people to think that they're rootless, that they're not grounded, or that they don't need to establish roots. Because when we think that way, we're invariably going to treat the whole world as a motel or as a shopping mall. And we know that people don't treat motel rooms very well. Uh, we know that they don't treat shopping centers that well. They go there to get their stuff and they're gone. And, and I think the, the, the illusion is to, first of all, believe that we're not rooted beings, right? We've got the skill, the ability, because we've got locomotion, that we think we can just go and uproot and go wherever we want and remain rootless. But the experience of eating, the experience of friendship, and nurture constantly remind us that we are connected to places. And I don't mean just places in general, I mean very specific places that feed us, that give us the energy we need, that give us 
the supplies we need to build our homes, to build our you know, infrastructure. So the point then is to figure out how do we draw the lines that are actually the roots that join us to communities and to places. And one of the ways we do that, simply enough, is through the exercise of gratitude. Saying grace before a meal, because that's when we take the time to acknowledge how this food that is on our plate came to be the food that is on our plate. Or when we stop to say thank you for the friends that we have. Again, we ask ourselves, what, what would my life be like if I didn't have friends X, Y, or Z in my life? Because they make our lives meaningful. Or if we stop to, to say thank you for a warm house, we have to start thinking about, well, how is it that we have heat or cooling? Or how is it that we have you know, a road, right? We, Indigenous people are very good at this, as are Jews, who regularly invoke the need to practice the rituals of gratitude, thanksgiving addresses, blessings throughout the day. Because it's so easy for us to go through this life mindlessly. And we've got an economy that is successful by making us ungrateful, right? You're always supposed to be thinking that what you have isn't good enough or not enough at all. And so we're always wanting more. So gratitude becomes a powerful way for us to bring to our minds the many elements, the many creatures that intersect our being to make our living possible. And when we draw attention to those gifts of friendship and nurture, we can then start to see the lines that really are the roots that become the source of nurture for us, much like the roots of a tree are the source of nurture for that tree. Um, we need to be able to do that. Well, we are just at the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wurzba, for being with us. Uh, and I hope for all of you that this has been uh, an inspiring opportunity to think about the places that we live and the ways that we nurture them uh, in new ways. Uh, again, if you are interested in thinking with the Westmont Center for Thriving Communities uh, about how we can do some of those things, look us up at westmont.edu slash thriving or drop us a note at thriving at westmont.edu. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Wurzba, for being with us. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining uh, this afternoon. Well, thanks so much. It was good to be with you. I wish you all well. Good night, everyone. <laughs>